Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guests today are poets Sarah Eliza Johnson and Jeffrey Schultz. They are both alumni of the UO's creative writing program. Johnson is the recipient of a 2015 National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. Her poetry collection, Bone Map, was selected for the 2013 National Poetry Series. Schultz is an assistant professor of creative writing at Pepperdine University. His poetry collection, What Ridiculous Things We Could Ask of Each Other, was also selected for the 2013 National Poetry Series. Johnson and Schultz gave readings of their work at the U of O on February 19th, 2015. Thank you both for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. And yes, welcome back you. to U of O. And thank yeah, you. It's terrific to be here. Yeah. So I know each of you completed MFAs here at different times, Jeffrey in 2003, Sarah in 2009. Can you each say something that was significant for you in your educational experience at UL? Um, well, I would say that the sense of community at the fine arts program here is, is really um, top notch. I think that um, students really care for each other and support each other, and that's encouraged by the faculty. I don't think, I think in some programs, um, I think s students have a more competitive environment facilitated by faculty. Um, or through you know the funding structures or whatever, but everybody's funded equally, so everybody um, doesn't have um, those issues. Um, and also, I just think that people really want to see each other succeed and support each other's work over here, which is which was really great for me, especially because I came here um, when I was 23, after um, right after college, and I think I really needed that kind of community to really thrive as, as a poet that I would eventually become. Jeff, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with that. Um, and I have, I mean, several friends from my time here still that I'm in touch with and who are great readers for my work. Um, I think in addition to that, I, I really appreciated that there was some real rigor to the program. Um, and I feel like I came out of here being able to think about the problems we face in composition um, in a much more critical way yeah. uh, than, than I would have if I had gone to another program. And I've been really thankful for that. And, s and talking to people who've gone to other MFAs, that seems like one of the really uh, defining features of Oregon's program, that you really have to learn and have to think and have to learn yeah. how to think about how to put these things together. Ah, Absolutely. Sarah, would you read a couple of poems from Bowman? Of Bowman's? course, of course. Um, so I will start with Dear Rub, which is the second poem in the book. Dear Rub, deep in the forest where no one has gone, where rain bloats the black moss and mud, a deer is rubbing its forelock and antlers against a tree. The velvet that covers the antlers unwinds into strips like bandages. The rain scratches at the deer's coat, as if trying to get inside, washes the antlers of blood, like a curator cleaning the bones of a saint in the crypt beneath a church at the end of a century, when the people have begun to think of the bodies as truly dead and unraisable, when children have begun to carry knives in their pockets. Once the last shred of velvet falls to the ground, the deer bends to eat it, nearly finished with ritual and altar, the tree side stripped of bark, while some place in the world, a bomb strips away someone's skin. The deer's mouth is stained with berries of its own blood. Then the deer is gone and the tree left opened the rain darkening red against the hole in the sapwood. The storm grows louder and louder, like a fear. The deer will shed its velvet four more times before dying of disease. The tree will grow its bark again. Each atom in each cell will remember the body it had made in this place, this time long after the rain flushes the river to flood, long after this morning, when the country wakes to another war, when two people wake in the house and do not touch each other. 
to read another? Yep, one more. Um, I will read When There Is Burning Instead, um, which has, it's, which takes its title from um, Isaiah chapter um, 3, verse 24. When There Is Burning Instead. After the war, after they have torn the sinews from the necks of sheep in the countryside, the wolves will come down from their forest into the city to eat the raw meat, to lap blood from bone bowls, their paws against the roads like the beat of a transplanted heart. They will compass about me where I lie. They will curiously graze their teeth against my cheek and lick the scrape on my hand. And I will not be afraid of them because my blood is bitter and my marrow rancid and my skin is a linen of bees and my tongue is split into two songs, two branches that grow soured figs up through the charred rubble of my throat. And I will sing one into your mouth if it would comfort you. And I will sing the other to comfort them, though they will only hear me howling. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Um, the two songs, the two tongues that you mentioned in the poem, when, and it's, I think it's very clear from the two poems that you've read, this is a volume that is characterized by striking images of um, beauty and also striking images of violence mm -hmm. and th viscera, et cetera. And in fact, one of the most surprising things about the volume is that sometimes those moments are the same moment. Mm -hmm. Should you say a little bit more about that striking aesthetic conjunction, those two voices of beauty and darkness or beauty and violence that are so important in this volume? Why, why are those the, the keys that are so often struck in this volume? Um, well, that's a good question. I think that ultimately, first of all, I see the poem as a space of cataclysmic change. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the most cataclysmic change, the most powerful transformational iteration of that is when you take um, a moment that could be characterized as sublime and really explore actually the viscera of that sort of moment. We're thinking about um, pleasure and terror and the intersection of those in the body um, and the kind of reworking of the brain and reworking of, of bodily experience that happens in the sublime moment. Um, and I think that ultimately I write poetry somewhat against, I think, our current culture, which I think, um, I think that I want to generate sublime moments for readers and to make them uncomfortable and somewhat disturbed with their, um, with their own humanity, um, their fragility, their own mortality, um, and to feel sort of awe at, at, at the world that surrounds them, in a sense. You mentioned that you're, you say you're writing against the, our contemporary yeah, I think world. So. But not, not entirely writing against it, but um, incorporating it um, in a way that it becomes unrecognizable, I think. One of the things, I, I mean, the <coughs> unrecognizability is striking. You've, you've talked about the volume as uh, being a, a kind of lonely dreamscape, and I'm, um, I'm interested in this idea of it as a kind of dreamscape. You, one of the things that isn't uh, very evident in your poems, which are very evident in, in Jeff's poems, are mm -hmm. evocations of contemporary, you know, daily life. Right. Why is, th why is it important that, that this is a kind of dreamland that you've evoked? Where did that idea come from? Well, I wouldn't so much say that it was an idea that I um, implemented so much as um, the kind of natural development of some sort of psychic landscape. So I was thinking, um, as I'm writing, I'm sort of translating, um, I suppose, the complexity of human psychology um, into 
a physical or material or material landscape and sort of showing the ways in which um, the body, um, the mind body and the, um, the world sort of intersect. Um, I think that, but I also think that dreamscapes are interesting places to sort of um, explore impossibilities. So I think I'm sort of interested also in not just reorganizing the world, but um, sort of remaking it, um, remaking it into a place in which miracles or the um, impossible can happen. Fascinating. Both you and Jeff uh, have in these volumes linked poems. Mm -hmm. In Bow Map, you have a series of epistolary poems, letters to, and a series of uh, archipelago poems. Mm -hmm. Tell us about one of those series and why series poems are something that you do, that you write. Okay. Um, yeah, those are two very different s series um, or, or sequences. Um, they developed at really different times in my life. Um, as well. I think that, well, I think a lot of my poems are born from research um, or just research interests, um, not in the academic sense, but just um, certain things that I, for some reason, feel intuitively drawn to. And one thing that I felt very drawn to was um, the voyage of St. Brendan. He was a sixth century monk who um, essentially went on um, a journey he like made a, with his apostles, he made um, a, a hide boat, right? This really tiny, fragile sort of boat. And he left um, the shores of Ireland in search of um, the Garden of Eden, essentially. Um, excuse me. And I was really just um, fascinated by that, by that legend. Um, and this, the sort of places that he stopped um, and the ways that, um, issues of, of faith and, and all these other human issues got um, translated mythically in, into those moments. Um, but also I thought it fit the book's, um, the book's trajectory narratively in the sense that um, the, the final, or the first section ends right with um, the ending of a world, again, an ap apocalyptic moment um, and then we sort of have the moment of the flood, and then the, it's following a very um, traditional, actually conventional um, <coughs> narrative trajectory. So um, I sort of wanted to have that, to sort of evoke that feeling of, of loneliness that would happen after an apocalyptic moment, um, and to just be the, um, the soul, the soul living, thing out, um, out in the, in the vast nothing. Tell us a little bit about your um, approach to the form of poems. How, how do you see form as a part of this project? Um, well, I think that I'm always thinking about the material experience of the poem. And so um, when I choose the form of the poem, I'm thinking about the way that's going to best evoke for the reader the experience that I want them to, to have. So for example, there's this poem lesson um, wherein the lines are, for example, um, sort of sprawled across the page and the, um, the narrative moment in the poem is um, a deer running um, very fast and sort of breaking apart the light, breaking the sun into um, blood and, and a very like violent, hectic kind of experience. So I didn't want to have a very, um, for example, um, blocky sort of, or like, um, or very even tercets or couplets because it just didn't fit um, the sort of breadth of the poem and, and the sort of um, mental state that the poem was meant to evoke. Um, whereas, for example, um, Seesaw is in um, very even tercets, um, in a sense, to sort of, <coughs> excuse me, um, sort of evoke the, the even rocking of a boat, right, and being out on the sea. Um, and even in some sense, I think, 
sea shanties, but not not quite in that way. Um, but um, yeah, I like the sort of um, song of the sea, the sort of rhythm of it. Um, so I think that that's one way in which form and content are sort of in intermingling in my poems. But I think a lot of times it is a very intuitive process for me. Mm -hmm. And I don't um, sort of start the poem in a form um, that reflects some sort of um, intended argument or something. It just sort of naturally, um, naturally occurs a lot of times for me. Hmm. So Jeff, would you read <coughs> a couple of your poems for yeah, us? Yeah, of course. Probably just start with the first one in the book. Um, it's called Jay Begins by Saying the World's Not As It Should Be. And I should have said this before, but it's one where the title runs in to the, the poem, sort of uninterrupted. So. Jay begins by saying the world's not as it should be. And then, embarrassed at the conversation's sudden death, all eyes at once on him, and daunted honestly that the prospect of going on, of cataloging in detail the slow distension each child's belly must endure and each piece of flesh cauterized without knowing it would be, without any time to prepare before the glowing hot shrapnel enters it and passes through, not certainly that preparation would help in any way. He raises his glass back to his lips and listens to the others go on as before, listens as the bar noise swells, exiles new fashion for the season, softer, sure, but harder perhaps from which to find one's way back. Even at the get-go, it was stupid. The idea he could make such a list and that, once made, it might be useful for something or other. No, it's idle chit-chat, gossip. Said what? Always has been a bitch. And the jukebox's brief pause between two more three minutes spins through nothingness. We join in, we sit out, but end of the night, there's hardly any difference as he scuffs up the leaf scent on the cold walk home the sky above crisp with autumn's first deep chill. The last buses have run their roots, have ferried in their blue fluorescence the faces of the tired to wherever it is the tired disappear. The streets are deserted. <coughs> my friends, please forgive my prying, but what have you all been up to lately? I feel like we never talk anymore like keeping in touch for no good reason has become impossible. Instead, long walks, bus rides, the self-checkout lanes smudged touchscreen and hideously inoffensive thank you for shopping. Then too many drinks each evening and these half-read stacks of books stillness as I fall asleep in spite of some sitcom's laugh track complication, one-liner, cheap resolution. Tell me, have you been well? Where you are, wherever that is, what colors, what sense does this time of year bring? Under skies like this, we think distances might dissolve. I almost see you there, your eyes barely able to track the words any longer, your hands cold always, for some reason, cold. It would have been nice if we'd lived closer together. We could see each other sometimes, not have to worry over someone to feed the cat, talk to him a little, water the plants, keep an eye on all these things. But that's it. I can only imagine. And no better than I can imagine anything, which means as I sit here looking out of your skull, it's the frames of my own glasses at the blurred edge of our vision. My double or yours? If yours, I like your taste in whiskey. Friend, once I dreamed of a beautiful country, and both of us were there, and everyone we do and do not know. And I tell you, I miss that place. I wish I could say just where we should go. 
O oh, my country, my lost and human country. Did you read another? Sure. Um, yeah, let me read. This poem reminds me of Oregon <laughs> for several reasons. Um, it's called The Soul as Social Service Caseworker. The two way mirrored visitation room's empty at last, and she's beat. A full hour the liver and the will argued, unwilling each to understand the other's point of view. Swollen and belligerent, the liver demands sole custody. The will, little brat, has counter-petitioned for emancipation. It goes nowhere. It seems always to go nowhere. Outside, the office parks parking lots nearly empty in the dusty early evening. Only a never once washed early model Volvo and a Toyota Tercel wagon remain. They seem, in fact, to have been abandoned, their once good-hearted owners having vanished as so many before into the archives in search of the one case history which would illuminate all others. Sometimes they're found wandering bile ducts, dazed, sometimes not. Only memory, a department decimated by budget cuts, has a backlog deeper than hers, but she's trying to dig out, puts in a few more hours off the clock, referrals for alcohol, depression, debt management, job training, everything in triplicate. Everything in a sort of untrained legalese. When she finally nods off, head propped on a stack of forms, she dreams in the problems of others. Dreams in paper cut and file folders endless beige. They're stacked so high you can't even see the cubicle walls, which are covered in clipped comics, printouts of funny email forwards, kids painted pictures the small things that make life at all bearable. Thank you. Yeah. Let's talk about that last line, the small things that <laughs> make life at all bearable. I mentioned before that in your, in your volume, and it's obvious in both of the poems that you just read, there is a kind of attentiveness to the everyday, the mundane, the detritus of contemporary reality. But there's also this search for value among this. Say something about that. Why, why is that important? Why is that something that happens in these poems? Well, I mean, I think for me a lot of it is a struggle to find ways to look at all of this. I mean, all of this being the contemporary world that could find meaning, right? I want there to be meaning. I want this to be meaningful. Um, and there's a well, but it's, it's hard when you actually walk around and look at things sometimes or watch the news or listen to the radio. Um, so, I mean, I think, in, you know, in a lot of ways, these poems are a record of my struggle to find an approach to experience that could make it meaningful or that at least, n which I, I don't want to say that I want to find meaning in things exactly as they are. Uh, but I would like to find ways to expose the meaninglessness of things as they are so that um, hopefully we might, as a group, be able to find approaches that could make it meaningful. I, 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 I do still hold on to hope that that's possible. Um, but it seems to me that, that you must look straight at the meaninglessness in order to, to open up that space for hope. Can I ask you, in light of that, how you understand the title of the volume, what ridiculous things we could ask of each other. Yeah. Um, it was a hard thing titling this book, actually. I mean, so it's, a, it's a mostly just a line from the last poem, and it's something my wife pointed out would be a good title. Uh, I was struggling to find them. But um, I mean, I, I love it. And it, I think it goes really nicely with the cover, because it seems that so much of what we face, so, so many of the problems we face, it seems to me that in a, in a perfect moment, we could all just agree not to do that anymore. Um, and, and it seems like simultaneously the, the easiest possible thing and the most impossible thing in the world 
uh, to, to, um, to sort of find that moment where we could say, maybe we don't have to treat each other this way anymore. Maybe we don't have to um, go through these struggles anymore. Maybe we could just agree to not do this. And that's, that's how the title sort of resonates for me. It would be, it's a ridiculous thing to ask, but it's also the ridiculous thing we must ask, I think, in, our, in my mind, yeah. Hmm. Very good. Um, you, like Sarah, also have sequence poems. You read two of them. One, one sequence is the J. Yeah. poems and the other sequence is the soul as says series. yeah say something about why you what series mean to you and something about either of those series well i with 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 both of those um i, I never intended them to be series they would just start um so i think for me it it, it just ends up being a you know it's a way to look at the world right like i find a certain lens or however you would want to conceptualize that to to, to look at experience and, and for a while that makes sense to me and I sort of keep, you know, as long as it keeps being fruitful for the poems, I try to stick with it. Um, I'm actually working on a new soul one now, so they seem to have not entirely died. The J ones I'm a little afraid of now because, um, <laughs> I don't know, it seems, I'm not sure how I wrote those, but, um, uh, but, but yeah, they, uh, it, it's accidental to some extent um, for me. Um, but, but like I said, they just are, yeah, they, 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 they're ways to start poems for me. So um, I, I keep them there. I like to preserve as much as the, of the process of putting the poem together as I can in the poem. I don't want them to be these static objects that look like they were just completely formed or something. So I, I think of them, those titles and those series as um, pieces of the process. Hmm. You mentioned that you're writing a new soul poem. Say, what are you working on now? Oh, um, well, they've got a new volume happening. Yeah, I've. I mean, I've basically got a second manuscript done, I think, um, and I'm sort of tinkering with that. I'm not sure the poem I'm working on now. I'm not sure if it goes in that manuscript or if it's the next one. Um, but the, <laughs> I mean, this is my problem. They since since the poems uh, from this book, they've only gotten longer. Um, I read f a 1,400 word sentence. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've gotten really, really interested in, in really long sentences. Um, yeah, so that's that's one of the things I'm experimenting with. So, sorry, can I ask you that <laughs> question? What, what are you working on? Um, I'm working on um, a series of poems. I, I don't, my fir my next manuscript is actually not. Um, it's it's in its beginning stages, but um, I'm working on um, poems that are invested in. Um, ecological disaster um, and in particular um, post-human and pre-human spaces um, and sort of trying to insert um, reader subjectivity into those spaces so um, like Precambrian Sea hmm. or um, the center of a black hole or um, any number of spaces that are not just inhospitable for human um, for human life, but also kind of impossible for human life, and okay. just yeah. I have to stop you. Okay. We're out of time. Okay. Thank you both so much for speaking with us. I wish we had more time to speak. Um, welcome back. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. This is terrific. I've been speaking with the poet Sarah Eliza Johnson and Jeffrey Schultz, alumni of the UO's Creative Writing Program. Johnson and Schultz gave readings of their work at the UO on Friday, February nineteenth, two thousand fifteen. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>